Well, hello team. We are continuing our jaunt into what can we use electron configurations for to figure out as far as, you know, atomic properties. So we already looked at, you know, predicting magnetic behavior. We looked at predicting uh, preferred ionic charges in a little more in-depth way using electron configurations. Well, let's look at atomic size and in a similar way, ion size. I'll put the, I'll put those two together because the concepts are the same. Um, using electron configurations and electron shielding and orbital penetration. We're going to apply all of this stuff we got from wave mechanic to try to figure this stuff out. And this is important because when we get to bonding later on, we need to understand how the size of an atom or ion impacts that. Because remember when, ion, when atoms come together, it's not the nuclei that interact first, it's the outermost valence shell. So it'd be nice to know how far away those valence shells are from the nucleus and see if that impacts things. Woo! All right. So we're going to picture atoms and ions as spheres. We okay? Spherical electron density. We're good with that. We good? And we can use the diameter or the radius to uh, determine the size of that sphere. Typically, chemists use the radius R, of course, half the diameter. We got a problem here, though. From wave mechanics, if you remember, the radial probability density that you know we, we saw moving so you got a certain amount of electron probability um, the density probability closer to the nucleus and then as n increases it dies away and fades off but it never quite fades to zero right you kind of get this peak and then it kind of tails off and so that that probability electron probability goes out to great distances technically i guess to infinity so how do you measure the size of a free atom if the electron density spreads out so far Right. Obviously, we draw a 95% containment curve to represent an orbital, but it's hard to do that. Let's say, well, let's just end the atom here and measure that radius. Where, where do you define the end of it? Right. It's hard to do. So we are not going to be able to measure the free size of an atom, uh, the, the radius of a free atom. Right. So how do we get the size of that? We're going to have to do some other tricks. Let's look at what those tricks are. I think this is a very simplistic approach to it. Makes sense. So let's take diatomic molecules. You know, remember the Magnificent Seven or Brinkelhoff, bromine, chlorine, hydrogen, nitrogen, fluorine. Let's take, for example, fluorine, All right? So we can go to a laboratory. We know these two fluorine atoms are bonded together, so they're set. We can easily measure the distance between the atomic nuclei, right? Can't really measure the size of a free atom, but I can measure the distance between two atoms covalently bonded, right? Well, let's call that D, the distance between the atomic nuclei. This is going to solve our problem, right? And this would be for covalently bonded nonmetals, right? We'll have to treat metals a little bit differently because they're not co covalently bonded. Ions will do a little bit differently. But if we can measure the distance between those two, and let's say that was 142 picometers, right? Back in the old days, they used to use angstroms or angstroms, right? With this capital A with a little circle over it. They defined that specifically for atomic dimensions. It was 100 picometers. It's not an SI unit, so they're getting away from it, just trying to leave it in picometers or nanometers, which is fine. But when I was first a first student, you know, 30 years ago, I 30 plus, okay, long time ago, um, that was still a unit that was quite common. Um, so they would just divide, right? If there's if an angstrom's a hundred, it's really an angstrom's one times ten to the minus tenth meters, so or a hundred picometers. So it's very easy, right? Just divide that by a hundred. You're good to go. But you probably won't see the angstrom unit used very often. So we'll stick with in my class, we'll stick with picometers, just because it sounds cool. And then what we do is just take that and take one half of it or divide it by two, just like for, you know, a circle. You got the diameter and the radius. So one half, 142 would be 71 picometers. So that would be the radius, the covalent radius for a fluorine atom. Now, I can do that for all the diatomics, fluorine, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Now, there's a lot. That, that gives me seven atoms that I know the, di the radius of. So now what I can do for other um, elements that don't form diatomic molecules, like carbon, or sulfur or something like that, I can now combine those with hydrogen or fluorine or oxygen. And if I know, even though they won't be the same atoms, so if, for example, I do HF, right? No, I already know hydrogen. So let's do like a carbon, carbon tetrafluoride and I get a carbon fluorine bond. Well, if I don't know carbon, but I know fluorine, I know fluorine 71 
and I can measure the distance between them, I can figure out carbon from that and in the process figure out every single other nonmetal. Oh, let's show you how that works. All right, let's see if this makes sense to you. It's kind of simple math, right? So if I want to get the covalent radius of any other nonmetal that does not form a diatomic molecule, because those are the easiest, right? Just divide the inter internuclear distance by two. Well, let's take, for example, so we know fluorine now. We know fluorine 71 picometers. Let's bond it to carbon, maybe form carbon tetrafluoride, CF4. Measure the internuclear distance between a carbon atom. Let's make the carbon atom blue <coughs> and the black one fluorine. So this would be the radius of the fluorine. That would be the radius of the carbon. If we add those two together, that would be the internuclear distance, right? Which we can measure in a laboratory. So let's say they measure that distance as 148 picometers between the two nuclei. But we know fluorine ra uh, covalent radius is 71. Well, D, the distance between the two nuclei, would be the radius of the fluorine plus the radius of the carbon. It's so simple. Well, we know this. We know this, so the radius, the covalent radius of carbon would just be the internuclear distance of 148 minus the covalent radius of fluorine, which we measured from F2 of 71, so 148 picometers minus 71 picometers is 77. That's how you get all the other ones. Pretty straightforward. Let's look at uh, metals real quick. For metals, it's pretty much the exact same thing, but just the metal atoms don't bond. So imagine taking a bunch of marbles and sticking them in a box, or, or if you had to go to the grocery store, you see how they stack oranges. Imagine you got one, a, you know, two-dimensional layer of oranges. You put an orange there and a bunch of oranges around it, and you get these little spaces called interstices. We'll look at this more next semester when we look at solids specifically. But we can easily measure the internuclear distance easily right? X-ray, diffraction patterns, that kind of stuff. So let's say that was 454 picometers for potassium solid. I could pick any solid, right? They form these crystalline lattices in three dimensions, just like stack oranges in three dimensions. Well, the radius, since they're the same atoms, the radius would just be one half of that distance. So a half of 454 would be 227 picometers, right? For potassium. Hey, hey! Pretty much almost the same thing as covalent radius. All right, uh, so a couple more and we'll get into some periodic trends. For ionic compounds, obviously we can't use the covalent radius because they're not neutral atoms anymore. You've got a cation and an anion. So would it make sense that the internuclear distance, right? You've got the nucleus of the cation, nucleus of the anion, is the sum of the radius of the cation plus the radius of the anion. We're gonna look at the sizes of cations versus neutral atoms and anions versus neutral, atom, neutral atoms later. So that's defined as the ionic radius. Now the problem with that, where do you start? That's hard to do like we did with a covalent one with the diatomic molecule. So most commonly we define a reference ion radius, right? Now to make this work, we all have to agree on that. And most people agree that the oxide ion is the reference state. And that's defined as 140 picometers. So we have a defined reference state. So now you can make any ionic compound with oxide, which is pretty common, pretty much any metal you want, any metal cation. So for example, let's do strontium oxide. Well, if we can use X-ray diffraction to measure the internuclear distance, right? So this is the radius of the strontium cation. This is the radius of the oxide anion. This is the distance between the nuclei. Well, we measure the distance between the nuclei. Let's say that's 253 picometers in the lab. We define the oxide anion radius as 140, so you just take the internuclear distance minus the radius of the, of the anion. So the radius of the strontium cation would be 253 picometers that we measured in lab, minus the 140 picometers that we defined, and you get 113 picometers for the radius of the strontium plus 2 ion. You can do that for any cation. And once you know that, now I can take strontium plus two and combine it with sulfide ions or any other anion I want. And eventually you can get them all. And you make little tables of them that show all the little uh, cations and anion radii. And we got the covalent radii for the neutral atoms. We're good, baby. We can also do this for noble gases are the tough one. Usually you won't see atomic radii for noble gases. They're trickier because you got to freeze them down, get what's called the van der Waals radius. We're not gonna be dealing with that here, but I wanna look at trends now. Let's look if I go down the periodic table or across the periodic table, how does the atomic or ionic sizes change? 
All right, we can look at trends on the periodic table going down a column or a group and going across. So that's what, let me get a periodic table here. Woohoo! So we're interested in how atomic size changes as we go down a column or a group and across a period, a row or a period. We can look at that quantitatively using wave mechanics, but typically it's better just to look at it qualitatively. So I'll just throw an equation at you to make you vomit a little bit and get some, you know, oh, my throat burns from stomach acid, just to give you an idea. But we'll typically, I'm not going to do calculations, we'll look at it qualitatively. So really, if you take wave mechanics, don't worry if that doesn't make sense. I'm just showing you the parameters that it depends on. But if you work through the wave mechanics and stuff, you kind of get this this average radius, right? Because you got all these different atomic orbitals with different angular shapes and stuff. It's equal to n squared, principal quantum number. So squared. So this is heavily dependent on the principal quantum numbers, right? Here's the nucleus. n equals one. n equals two. n equals three. n equals four. So obviously, as you add n, you're adding an, a principal uh, electron shell. It's getting way, I was going to say huger, way gihugious. And my, my kids are always mixing those words. Hugantic, I don't know. <laughs> Times the Bohr radius, 53 picometers, divided by the effective nuclear charge. Remember that due to uh, screening. Nuclear charge Z is just the number of protons in the nucleus. But the effective nuclear charge takes into account electron shielding and screening, which we looked at before. Times this mess over here that's dependent on the angular momentum quantum number. Is it an SPD or F orbital? And again, there's the principal quantum number. Oh, there's a lot to it. But the two main factors are the effective nuclear charge and N. We need to look at the, the, the co-play between those two to see if atoms get bigger or smaller as we move along the periodic table. Right? So what we're going to do, obviously if I'm moving down, this is N1, N equals 2, N equals 3. So N's increasing, and it's squared, so it's dramatic. Over here, yeah, if N gets bigger, you know, this gets smaller, but that term doesn't really have an impact on it because that, that gets bigger. This term goes down and goes closer to one, so I'm not too concerned about it there. That's the big impact there. So obviously that's huge. But if you're going across, you're not changing the end value. So really what we're doing is we're changing. We need to see how the effective nuclear charge changes as we go across. Yeah, so we'll look at both going down and going across. Now remember, Z effective is the original nuclear charge, protons in the nucleus, minus some factor that is adjusted because of the electron shielding, right? That's the impact of electron screening or shielding. We are not going to be able to calculate that by hand. You can do it with computer software models, right? So I did this at UCI. It was a Hartree Fock or something. Um, and there was some other LM. I forget the terms. There's a whole bunch of different models you could choose from. Uh, the more, the better the model, the longer computer time it took. So you could do kind of a simplified model, and it might take 20 minutes. You know, go go grab a soda or something like that. But if you wanted to do some really hardcore accurate ones to get really accurate computer determined value, uh, variables for atomic properties and bonding information, you might have to go to uh, one of the better uh, supercomputers in the world. Um, fly over there, reserve time, and then start a calculation, and uh, a couple days later you come back. Whoa, right? So it depends on the time and money you have. Um, but one of the first ones back in the 30s was SCF, or the self-consistent field. Oh my gosh, how do you deal with it? What if you had 15 electrons? Right, so you take one electron, look at the impact of the other 14, and then you take electron number two, look at the back of the other 14, take electron number three, what's the impact of the other? And you do it for all 15 electrons, looking at the effect of the other 14, and oh, how do you solve for all that? Ah, forget it, man. So you kind of put in this initial guess, have the computer, you know, calculate the information, and then you take that answer and plug it in as your new guess, and take that information and plug it in as, an, and you keep going until when you put in a value, you get pretty close to the same value coming out. You do these iterate; it's an iterative process. We're going to do that next semester when we do some equilibrium calculations. When we get these polynomial functions like x to the third plus something x squared plus, so where you can't use, you know. Um, the quadratic equation or something like that. So we do uh, uh, a special, it's called successive approximations, where we make an initial guess, plug it in, take that answer, plug that in, get another answer, come on. You keep doing it until you get the same answer out you put in. It really sucks. Let computers do it. <laughs>
So that's where that screening factor comes from. But if you're into computer modeling, you can literally take computational chemistry. You can major in chemistry and never set foot in a lab or, or need a pair of goggles. You can just work on computer. I got a buddy over at UCI that's, that does awesome, awesome work with computer simulations. So we'll do something in lab and then he'll try to model it and see if his models match what we get. And if it doesn't, either his model needs to be fixed or our experiment screwed up. Usually me, no. <laughs> right. So anyway, you can have fun with it, but let's qualitatively look at the impact of Z effective and the principal quantum number on atomic, si atomic size trends as we move down a column or across a row, yay. All right, to oversimplify this qualitatively, if we are going down a group, right? So say hydrogen down to francium, you know, beryllium down there, moving down anywhere, you're adding a shell, right? Would that make sense? You're adding a shell. So it's got to be getting bigger, right? Now what's happening, but you're also adding protons to the nucleus. But as you add protons to the nucleus going down, you're also act adding all of those orbitals that tend to screen out the uh, effect of the increasing charge. So it kind of cancels out, not completely, but it really minimizes the effect of the uh, effect of nuclear charge. So it's not a dramatic change going down the periodic table because you have so much increased electron screening, but you're also increasing the nuclear charge. Kind of cancels out mostly. The n value is what dominates. Remember, and it's an n squared dependency. If you remember that equation, it's it's not just n; it's n squared. Holy moly! So you get this pretty dramatic jump as you move from n equals one to n equals two to n equals three in the same group, right? So does it make sense? As you add an electron shell, n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, n equals four. Blah blah blah. blah. It's not quite as dramatic as you get further out because you start getting the d and f orbitals that don't quite screen as efficiently but it still goes up. Let's kind of show you some values, so pictorially. All right, so I'm doing the easy one first. Going down is easier than going across because you don't have to worry about Z effective. So we know atomic size increases going down, so this just gives you a feel. So I only had room for four, so I did some of the alkaline earth metals with the metallic radii, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium. So beryllium's about 111 picometers for its radius. Jumps up, right? So where's beryllium? So if we look at beryllium, that's in n equals 2. So n equals 1, n equals 2. So that's n equals 2. Magnesium is n equals 3. Calcium is n equals 4. And strontium is n equals 5. Right? So n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5. Goes from 111 to 160 to 197 to 215. Right? So we can write these in here. So this is n equals 2, n equals 3. I'll put it inside, n equals 4, squishy, it's easier with the bigger atoms, right, so 2, 3, 4, 5, easy peasy, right, getting larger, pretty dramatic too, right, very noticeable, that's going to impact its chemistry, hmm. let's look at going left to right across a row. All right, going left to right, a little bit more challenging. So would you agree, you say I'm starting at potassium. Right here, I've got 19 protons. When I go to calcium, I got 20 protons. See that? So you're increasing the atomic number by one. I'm also increasing an electron by one. All right, so going left to right, the electron is in the same, we're, we're in the same energy level going across. So N is almost irrelevant here. It's all about Z effective because we're adding protons to the nucleus in the same electron shell. So we need to see, is Z effective increasing or decreasing? Because we have to look at the fact of two things. As we're increasing protons in the nucleus, we're increasing Z. But as we're adding electrons, we're increasing the shielding. Or are we? Oh, right? Because it, the electrons are going in the same shell. See what I'm saying? So it's very minor. So now if I'm, if I'm an electron here and I add an electron here, that's going to screen me out from the nucleus. But if I have an electron here and I add an electron here, they're in the same sub-level or energy level. They're not screening each other. It's a little bit, but it's not nearly as dramatic. So and the electron adding in the same shell, the increased electron shielding is very, very minor compared to the increased Z. So the net effect is going left to right, 
across, Z effective increases, right? So if Z effective increases, that means the positive nuclear charge the electrons are seeing is increasing. So as you're going across a row, you might have electrons here, and as you add protons and electrons, the effective nuclear charge is increasing, so the size of the atom starts to decrease because that increased nuclear charge is pulling all the electrons closer to the nucleus. Let's draw that. Going across, right? We know Z effective is increasing because the minimized electron shielding, but the increasing uh, number of protons. So all electrons are pulled closer and it pulls closer and closer to the nucleus. It also changes their energy too, right? It holds them in tighter. So that's going to affect how hard it is to remove an electron. Oh, that's coming later. So atomic size decreases across a row, but I want you to be able to explain this. This is, These are great short answer questions on exams and quizzes. Whoa, you need to be able to explain things. So if we take, say, N equals 3, starting at sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine. So that's going across right here. So you see the 11 protons, 12 protons, 13, 14, 15, 16, 16 moving across. Right? So we're going across. So Z equals 11 all the way up to 17, all in N equals 3, so minimized electron shielding. So sodium is 186 picometers for its radius. Drops down to 160 for magnesium. I'm going to put a little decimal there. Boop. And you can find tables of all these. You'll never have to memorize these. 143 for aluminum, drops down to 117 for silicon, pretty close down to phosphorus, 110, drops to 104 for sulfur, and down to two digits, 99 picometers for chlorine. Pretty distinct. Now there's a specific reason I didn't do N equals four, for, well, two reasons. One, I didn't do this because I couldn't fit them all on my board, and two, the transition series. That puts a little wrench in the machine because something weird happens for transition series. So the lanthanides, the F, the D subblock, and the F subblock, we're going to see something really weird because the size remains pretty much con almost, almost constant going across a D shell and going across an F shell. An F shell. Why? Why? For the transition metals and the lanthanides actinides. Right, transition metals are D block, lanthanides, actinides are F block. There's a slight, same idea, you're adding, right? As I go across, I'm adding a proton, adding an electron, adding a proton, adding an electron, adding a proton, adding an electron. The difference though, remember for the, uh, for the S and P block, for S and P block, the added electron falls in the same end level. But when you're doing it here, the added electron doesn't go in the same level, end level, it falls into an inner subshell, right? Because remember electron, you know, orbital penetration and stuff? So the added electrons, as you go and add a proton electron, the added electron falls in an inner subshell, which more effectively screens. Oh my gosh. And remember, the outer one, which measures the distance, is the prior S in a higher end level. So you get more efficient electron screening by adding the D and F electrons. That changes things for the D block and F block. Let's see how. Do you see it? Right? So the increased electron shielding, because you're adding D and F inner electrons, that's increased electron shielding, essentially cancels out the added protons adding the Z. So pretty much Z effective is constant when you move across transition metals in the D block or the lanthanides and actinides in the F block. Z effective is effectively constant. More in the middle of it, kind of in the beginning, it's a, it's a little more dramatic, but in the middle of it, man, they're mostly the same. So atomic size remains mostly constant going across the D and F block, transition metals, lanthanides, and actinides, or the inner transition metals. So I, I only could only fit five on here, so I took some of the part of the 3D subshell. So chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, and nickel. Right, so you're looking right across here, right? Adding protons, but adding an electron in the 3D subshell. But remember, 3D subshells here, 4S is up above it. So you're adding electrons here, which is canceling out Right, the screening's canceling out the protons. So Z, 24 protons all the way up to 28. And you got 125 picometers for chromium going to 124 for manganese, 124 for iron, 125 for cobalt, 125 for nickel. Whoa! 
Well, that's pretty crazy, huh? All right, so let's look at ions, cations versus their parent atom and anions versus their parent atom. What happens? I think you could probably figure it out. Cations were always kind of easier for me than anions because you got a cation, right? And you lose electrons. So you're reducing electron repulsions, right? Sometimes you lose an entire shell, boop, right? If you're, if you're dealing with alkali metals or alkaline earth metals or aluminum or something, you lose the entire outer shell and the whole thing shrinks down, right? But the number of protons stays the same. You're just losing electrons. So you're getting this positive charge. So the metals lose electrons, sometimes the entire shell, right? Of course, it's going to decrease in size. The Z effective increases for cations. So the size of the cation is always less than the parent atom size. For example, I did scandium. Where's my periodic table? So if we take scandium, it has 21 protons. But if we lose that these uh, 4s electrons and the 3d, so it empties it out, it loses that entire shell and becomes isoelectronic with xenon. No, oh, not Xenon, I went the wrong way, with Argon, right? So you go from 21 down to 18. So you're effectively losing an entire shell by losing the three electrons. So neutral scandium is 161 picometer radius. You lose the shell, boop, drops down to 75 picometers. That's pretty dramatic jump. So cations are way smaller than their parent, parent atom, cation, parent atom, cation. Since anions are opposite cations, you kind of think it's going to be the opposite effect. Well, maybe, maybe. Hopefully this makes sense, right? So we're looking at anions, which we're adding electrons, right? So we're not removing them. It's impossible to lose a shell like a cation. But when you add electrons, now the number of protons stays the same, right? You're just adding electrons, not protons. Well, that increases electron repulsions, right? Can you see electrons repulsions are increasing? There's more screening. It's going to get a little bigger. Z effect is decreasing, right? More shielding. Z is the same. So Z minus S, S is increasing. So Z effective goes down. If you remember that equation I gave you. What that means essentially is the anion is always bigger than the parent atom. Take, for example, selenium. That's got a radius of 117 picometers. All right, so if we look at selenium, where's selenium right there? One of the chalcogens. Right, it's got 34 electrons. Well, it wants to be like krypton, so it's going to pick up two electrons. Right, You're in the same N level. You still have 24 pro, 34 protons, but now you've got 36 electrons. You've got increased repulsions and screening, so it gets bigger, so the selenide ion jumps up to 198 picometers. Jumped up a little bit, and, and as you add more electrons, there's in, it causes an increase in size, right? So let's do one more thing. What if we have a series of cations and anions that are isoelectronic? They all have the same number of electrons. Oh, because remember, all these elements want to become like the noble gases, right? So metals are working backwards, uh, nonmetals are working forwards to try to achieve an isoelectronic configuration with the nearest noble gas. Well, there's a pretty easy trick on comparing sizes if they are all isoelectronic. Let's take a look. Isoelectronic species are actually pretty simple, right? And again, iso means same, so isoelectronic means they have the same number of electrons. Remember, that's the driving force for everything uh, to become isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas, right? So if that's the case, they all have the same number of electrons. We don't have to worry about the shielding as much. It's all about the number of protons. And the more protons it has, the larger its effective Z value, right? And the bigger Z effective, it shrinks it in, the smaller the radius. So for isoelectronic species, the larger the Z, the smaller the species. So let's take a look at magnesium, sodium, fluor fluoride. So the magnesium ion, sodium ion, fluoride ion, and oxide ion. So if you take a look, if fluoride, fluorine picks up an electron, it becomes isoelectronic with neon, with 10. Oxygen picks up two to have 10 electrons. And if you look over here, sodium loses one to end up at 10 electrons, and magnesium loses two. They all end up with 10 electrons, right? So all of them have 10 electrons, so they are isoelectronic. But look at the number of protons, right? Oxygen has eight, fluorine has nine, sodium has 11, magnesium has 12. So we've got 12 protons, 11 protons, nine protons, and eight. Well, if you have more protons, it pulls them in tighter, right? Larger Z effective. 
So we would expect the magnesium cation to be smaller than the oxide, right? And fluoride to be smaller than oxide, the isoelectronics. So you've got about 72 picometer radius for magnesium ions, about nine, jumps up to 99 for sodium, right? So the higher the cation charge, the smaller it is typically. Jumps way up to 133 picometers for the fluoride, right? Got that inc increased electron screening. Um, and then uh, 140 picometers for oxide ions. There you go. You can compare anything on the periodic table. You guys can do this.